previous lectures, we have discussed about the basic principle of electrophoresis and various techniques concerning the electrophoresis of proteins and nucleic acids. In today, in this lecture, we are going to discuss about two more techniques. One is immunoelectrophoresis and another is the capillary electrophoresis. So, we will discuss immunoelectrophoresis first. Now, immunoelectrophoresis is a technique for studying antibody and antigen, particularly their interactions where the specificity of immunoprecipitin reactions are combined with separation of molecules by electrophoresis. So, this technique allows you to see the interaction or to identify the antigen if the antibodies are available. Now, before we go into the technique of immunoelectrophoresis, certain basic things needs to be understood. Like we were talking about immunoprecipitin reactions. Now, what are these precipitin reactions? So, uh, let us understand this. Now, precipitin reactions uh, supposing if increasing amount of an antigen say human serum albumin or some other protein is mixed with a suitable fixed amount of antibody solution say rabbit anti human uh, serum album albumin or for that matter against any particular antigen. What will happen initially the amount of antibody antigen precipitate increases as you increase the antigen concentration. Now, uh, as they uh, you are adding what is happening is uh, one thing has to be understood is many times there are two sides uh, on the same antigen where the antibody can bind. It means you have more than one antigenic determinant. So, uh, for example, there are a lot of repetitions or certain proteins, uh, membrane proteins or receptors which are uh, present. Uh, there are specific repeating features which are present, which can act as antigenic determinants. So, when antigen uh, interacts with the antibody, antibody can bind to two antigen molecules. And what will happen is, if there is uh, certain uh, concentrations of antibody antigen at particularly at equivalence, then they form uh, a large lattice sort of structure, uh, which leads to uh, visible precipitation. It means that the structure becomes so large that you can see it as a precipitate. I will show you that and that precipitate is called precipitin. So, in precipitin reaction at certain point when you add antigen to a suitable amount of antibody or a fixed amount of antibody at a certain point when at a uh, when uh, concentration of antigen and antibody reaches equivalence or equal then there is a lot of interactions and a large lattice structure forms which leads to the visible precipitate all right so now, when you are adding, I will show you this in a little by while. So, uh, as you add the antigen and uh, as I said, uh, a lot of precipitate is formed uh, and visible precipitate which could be seen is formed. Uh, but what happens is, as you uh, keep on adding the ant antigen, a sharp plateau indicating that all of the antibody had been precipitated is not obtained here. And rather, precipitate apparently dissolves at higher concentration of antigen. And this is due to the solubility of antigen antibody complex containing a single antigen molecule. Even if the antibody molecules is bound to every antigenic determinants, the resulting precipitin curve will contain. Uh, so, what is happening here is that uh, at excess antigen, the complex which is visible precipitate will dissolve. Uh, now, so if you see the dynamics of this uh, or precipitin curve as we can call it, it contains three zones actually. One is zone of antibody axis, where the addition of antigen leads to a substantial increase in the amount of precipitate. So, as you start ad adding the antigen from a small quantity, then there will be antibody axis. Second part of the curve is zone of equivalence where 
when the maximum antigen antibody precipitate is formed. And third part of the curve is the antigen axis, uh, where uh, when you add more antigen that is after equivalence the precipitate dissolves actually. All right. So, let me show you uh, this whole thing on the screen. What you have is, if I show you the precipitant curve, precipitant curve will look something like this. You have antigen on this axis and you have antigen antibody, AG for antigen, AB for antibody uh, precipitate or you can say uh, precipitate which is kind of seen as you add, add the uh, antigen. So, what you see is there is a, a curve kind of looks like some sort of this kind of pattern where you have certain regions actually and these regions if we call them this one that is the first one is the zone of antibody axis. This is antibody axis, this is zone of equivalence and here when you have added sufficient quantity of antigen then it is zone of antigen axis. So, uh, what does uh, that this means actually? This means like if you see uh, in first set you will have lots of antibodies which are around and there will be certain uh, interactions but and as you are increasing this uh, uh, there will be antibody access but as you increase the antigen there will be some precipitate will be seen and uh, on increasing concentration of antig antigen visible precipitate will be more. Now, in zone of equivalence large lattice structures are formed like I said if you have lot of these equivalent antigen molecules it is like you will have lot of these kinds of structures which kind of are in a long range uh, and they will be formed uh, in a very long range and they will be like uh, uh, visible precipitate which could be centrifuged and uh, measured also could be obtained. In zone of antigen axis you will have lot of antigens uh, as compared to number of antibody molecules and there could be uh, like lot of antigen which is uh, because you have a fixed amount of uh, antibody. So, this is a curve or we call it precipitin curve. Now, uh, how do you uh, see this curve uh, as you go along? There are a lot of different methods to see this curve and there is one uh, process through which you can see the antigen antibody interaction is immunodiffusion. So, there could be different uh, uh, forms of immunodiffusion which could be a uh, single immunodiffusion and it could be double immunodiffusion. Single immunodiffusion means that only antigen is moving and antibody is immobilized and it could be in one dimension or it could be in two dimensions. In double immunodiffusion both antigen and antibody moves towards each other and interacts to form the precipitin lines and that could also be in one dimension or in two dimensions. So, let us uh, see that uh, the phenomenon of immunodiffusion let me show you on your screens actually all right. So, uh, the immunodiffusion one is like I was saying uh, it could be simple immunodiffusion uh, uh, or single immunodiffusion where only one uh, one of the reactant that is antigen moves towards antibody. Uh, it could be like I said it could be in one dimension or it could be in two dimensions. So, say in one dimension if we are saying if this is particular now if this is your uh, agar containing this is your agar containing uh, agar having antibody. 
and this is antigen solution kept in here. Now, so antigen solution is kept on top and this is agar which contains antibody a particular antibody for that antigen uh, at time t 0. Now, these things uh, takes immunodiffusion takes lot of time uh, like days together and so uh, we will not be talking about that, but what we are talking about is simply the phenomenon. So, uh, what happens is what will be the second step in here? All right, so it is the same thing. Now, this antigen solution and this is agar containing antibody. Now, what will happen is slowly the antigen will start moving into the agar which contains antibody. Now, the precipitin line or the curve which I have shown you as the antigen enters there will be antibody access. So, what will happen as antigen interacts with the antibody there will be a very minor precipitate is formed and there will be very thin precipitin line could be seen. Now, as antigen enters more antigen enters into the gel uh, or agar then slowly the antigen concentration increases and then from antibody axis you will find antigen antibody equivalence at certain point. So, what, ha what will happen first you will see a precipitin line as uh, a visible like because it will be very thin in the beginning. So, you will see a precipitin line and this precipitin line is seen as antigen concentration increases. Now, what happens is the precipitin line moves in this direction actually. The precipitin lines moves down here because as the antigen comes in antigen axis occurs and at certain point the, the precipitin or antigen antibody complex dissolves. So, antigen uh, but antigen concentration ahead is little less. So, the anti uh, what happens is essentially the precipitin lines starts from here, but it keeps on moving downwards. So, what, what you will get is finally at certain period of time you will see that the anti precipitin line has moved quite far depending on the antigen concentration because at uh, after some time antigen will be done and so precipitin line will move to a certain extent. So, you can see this at say time 1 at 3 different times say uh, and this is in days actually you will see that precipitin line is formed and then it moves down and at certain point it stabilizes and that depends on the concentration of anti, uh, antigen. So, that is how a precipitin lines can be, be formed and can be seen in single dimension. Now, the this thing simple immunodiffusion can be in two dimension also. Now, how does it happens in two dimensions? Now, what is done is in two dimensions this is done on a very simple microscopic slide actually. Now, here uh, what you do is you punch uh, different uh, you can say holes or slots for loading the antigen solution. So, these are the wells which are being cut these are wells actually and these wells have been cut in here for uh, putting in uh, the antigen solution. Now, here different concentration of say 50, 100, 150, 200 increasing concentration of antigen is loaded in here just to see the effect here. So, what we will see is that there will be radial diffusion in all directions in all the wells once you have loaded the sample. So, it will, uh, but it is in uh, simple diffusion since only antigen is moving and this uh, agar uh, uh, this antibody is contained in agar actually. So, antibody with agar is put in here. Uh, now, when the movement occurs then what will happen precipitin lines will be formed in here. Now, as the concentration increases so is the size of the or the uh, uh, diameter of the precipitin lines will be. So, what you have seen at 50 micrograms say for example, just for example, there is a precipitin lines which is not farther from the center here and as the concentration increases the precipitin line also moves. So, this clearly shows that 
more is the antigen concentration farther the precipitin line will be formed. As we have seen in here also simple uh, uh, first uh, simple immunodiffusion also in one dimension. So, what you can do is in here you can always make a standard curve here and this standard curve uh, can be used for knowing the concentration of unknown sample. So, this is simple immunodiffusion and you can get precipitin lines which can be visualized. All right, so, this was simple or single immunodiffusion. Now, same thing can happen with double immunodiffusion. Let us see how double if you immunodiffusion will occur. Uh, in double immunodiffusion, uh, what you are going to see is that rather than uh, like uh, simple uh, uh, this uh, antigen moving both things will move. So, what you have if it is a single dimension in single dimension what they will have is there will be uh, antigen solution and then there will be agar which does not contain anything and there will be agar containing antibody. So, antibody in agar. So, here what will happen here this is not immobilized antibody with the antibody in here is not immobilized. So, what will happen antibody will move towards this side and antigen will move in towards the antibody and antibody will move towards the antigen. So, what is going to happen now that as it moves as both things move towards each other you will get and as we have seen you will get lot of precipitin lines depending on. So, these are what you call uh, precipitin lines. Now, you will see one precipitin line if there is only single antigen and anti sera for that you will see multiple precipitin lines if it is a complex mixture of antigen and corresponding antibodies are available in that anti serum. So, this is double immunodiffusion that is in single dimension. Now, this could also be in like I said two dimensions in two dimensions what is done there is a very simple way like there will be agar uh, on this microscopic slide you can punch a central hole. Uh, where you can put anti serum and you can have uh, slots for placing uh, you can have slots for placing antigen and these antigens could be in different concentration. Now, depending on the concentration like I said uh, more is the concentration of antigen farther will be the, uh, uh, the precipitin lines accordingly you will get a pattern which will be seen in here that is precipitin lines will be seen as per the concentration and this is double immunodiffusion here antigen like these are moving in all directions. Likewise antibody is also moving in all directions and at certain point they will be in equivalence and where they will form a visible precipitin lines. So, that is the double immunodiffusion. Now, there is another uh, important part of this double immunodiffusion is that how does they look like uh, like there are like reaction uh, of identity or partial identity or non identity um, are very important. Uh, for example, if you have same antigenic determinants what happens if there are partial uh, resemblance in antigenic determinant or there are no uh, resemblance in antigenic determinant. So, let us see what is that. Now, everything is same like you have a plate microscopic plate you have a agar containing uh, uh, things. So, what is done is to see this particular phenomena that is reaction of identity one is that you have like I said like here it is antigen and there it is antibody that is anti a b. Now, see here both have same antigenic determinant a b a b. So, what will happen this is reaction of identity and how does this particular precipitin line will look like that what we are interested in. So, precipitin lines in this case will kind of merge actually that is the precipitin line of interaction between these two and precipitin line of the interaction between the both, both wells they will merge with each other 
and so this is called reaction of identity where you have identical antigenic determinants. Uh, second case could be where you have uh, uh, non identity that is both deter, uh, antigenic determinants are. So, second one could be reaction of non identity. Now, in this case like I said they could be different antigenic determinants like say I say these are two antigenic determinants you have only anti a b. So, what you have is you do not have common antigenic determinant. So, what will be the resultant you will find a kind of uh, a pattern which crosses each other they are not identical and third case could be partial identity the reaction of partial identity in partial identity there is at least one common antigenic determinant like say if I say this is a c and a b and you have anti a b same anti uh, antibody or anti sera then what will happen is since there is only partial identity it will look something this sort of pattern will be seen that is in case of that at least one antigenic determinant is common. So, this is how this will look like there is another important or interesting aspect of immunodiffusion in here and that is you can determine in determine or you can have an idea of the molecular weight of a particular uh, antigen that is effect of molecular weight of an antigen on the precipitin lines actually. So, that is also very interesting to see all right. So, what we can let me show you this here all right. So, again this is a microscopic slide where agar uh, is uh, there and you have punched two holes. Um, so, let us see first in the case of this is antigen say this is antigen A and this is anti A that is antibody A or anti serum you can say against antigen A. Now, uh, to just like it will not give you uh, say uh, what is the molecular weight, but it will give you an idea about the molecular weight in terms of whether it is bigger than antibody uh, or it is smaller than antibody. Now, in case of where antigen has a smaller molecular weight as compared to antibody, then what you get? You get a pattern something like this that is you have uh, like uh, uh, a pattern where precipitin will line will be towards uh, like it will curve towards the antibody. Uh, there could be another one that is say antigen B and there is anti B these are the slots we have in agar plate this is agar plate uh, and it uh, facilitates the diffusion because uh, it is a large pore size is there uh, it is not a separation as such. Now, say antigen equals antibody molecular weight equals then you will see a straight line here rather than a curved line uh, and if you have I think you must have guessed the third scenario say there is antigen C and there is anti C. The third scenario would be that if say antigen is bigger than or antigen uh, molecular weight is more than the antibody then there should be curve which is different or opposite to the uh, curve which where antigen molecular weight was lower. So, these kinds of patterns will be seen and could be given idea on in uh, this particular experiment of immunodiffusion. All right, so uh, let us go back to our discussion. So, we were discussing about uh, immunodiffusion and precipitin lines. Now, let us get back to the immunoelectrophoresis. So, immunoelectrophoresis is extension of what we are discussing, and it could be two kinds qualitative and quantitative immunoelectrophoresis. Now, first step in immunoelectrophoresis is to separate our antigen sample into their component part by electrophoresis. So, that is why it is immunoelectrophoresis because you are performing electrophoresis to separate the mixture of antigens on agro gel. Uh, in second step it will be similar to immunodiffusion, 
what is done is these separated components are probed with antibodies in the gels and the specificity of antibody facilitates the identification of antigen in given sample. So, what is done is a very thin say uh, 1 to 2 millimeter agarose gel, it could be say around 1 percent uh, gel is cast on a glass plate or microscopic slide and antigen samples are placed in small circular wells as I have shown you, uh, which could be 2 to 4 millimeter in diameter and it is punched in the gel. Now, gel is placed between the electrodes chambers in horizontal electrophoresis setup. Now, mostly it is the anodic migration that is from uh, negative to positive electrode. Now, gel is in contact with the electrophoresis buffer through buffer saturated filter paper wicks. A suitable uh, immunoelectrophoresis buffer which can be like 0 0.08 molar tris, uh, 0 0.02 molar tristine, 0.3 millimolar calcium lactate pH 8.6 or there could be other buffers will be utilized. Uh, and the electric field uh, is applied in order of say 5 volt per centimeter. Now, what is done like it is a simple electrophoresis after electrophoresis is complete then antigen mixtures will be separated as per uh, their charge. Um, then anti sera will be placed in longitudinal troughs uh, which are 1 to 2 millimeter wide I will show you this which are again cut into the same gel uh, and parallel to the migration path and one trough is cut on each side of the sample lane. Like if you have two sample lanes then you can cut two if it is a one you can cut one uh, trough. Uh, and different anti sera will be placed in there. Like if there are two lanes or three lanes, then you have to have anti sera for each. Now, gels are then incubated overnight at room temperature in humid chamber. Remember, uh, all these experiments of immunodiffusion are done in humid chamber. The antigens diffuse readily and antibodies will diffuse laterally because they are in longitudinal troughs towards each other and resulting into antigen antibody interaction and precipitin arcs, where antigen and antibody have appropriate concentrations that is equivalence actually. Now, the precipitin arcs can be visualized directly or they could be seen by staining uh, like say pres presence of precipitin arc is uh, evidence for both antigen in the sample and the antibody in the anti serum. So, uh, this is how simple qualitative immunoelectrophoresis will be performed. All right, so, let me give you an idea about how the whole procedure is being done, but as uh, uh, we have already uh, done this in uh, earlier just to give you an idea. So, what you have is a simple microscopic or glass slide and this glass slide contains if I say uh, particularly. what you have is and you have say particular antigen sample, particular antigen mixture. Now, there will be a longitudinal trough in here which is cut in the gel uh, only. So, what will be the next step? Next step would be the electrophoresis. In electrophoresis what will happen? You have uh, so your sample will run. Now, remember uh, since it is uh, uh, from cathode to anode those samples which carry a negative charge will run towards this side. So, that has to be uh, experiments have to be planned accordingly. So, when it runs what will happen? There will be a migration and you will find as it runs here you will find different bands in here that is separated antigen from uh, components from the mixture. Now, what so once you have run the uh, electrophoresis as we have discussed the next step would be to fill this so, next step would be. So, what you have is you have these components from antigen mixture and you have what you will fill in anti sera for that particular or antibody solution for that particular antigen and this contains antibodies for each of these samples or for one sample like say you are looking for to identify certain sample then it might contain antibody for that. 
So, what will happen now? There will be literal diffusion like I said from this well and there will be radial diffusion from these in all directions. So, what resultant would be? You will find after some time like say incubating overnight, you will find them. So, what you have is you have these kinds of patterns or and you have anti sera here. What you will find is you will find the precipitin lines for this samples actually after incubating overnight. So, you will be able to uh, if it is led to identification then you will be able to identify because you will find only uh, precipitin line for that particular antigen sample you are looking for. So, this is a very simple qualitative immuno electrophoresis. All right. So, that is how you can perform immuno electrophoresis and uh, could identify or you could analyze the particular antigen. Uh, there could be quantitative immuno electrophoresis also one and two dimensional rocket immuno electrophoresis. Now, the two major vari variations of uh, this is one and two dimensional rocket electrophoresis uh, or immuno electrophoresis and the name rocket is due to the rocket shaped precipitin patterns formed following antigen antibody reaction. Now, height of the precipitin peaks are roughly proportional to the concentration of antigen in the sample and therefore, these methods can be considered as quantitative immuno electrophoresis. In rocket immuno electrophoresis antigens are subjected to electrophoresis as we have shown you in agarose gels containing suitable antibodies and the pH of the electrophoresis buffer is chosen so that it is near to the pi of the antibody molecule. So, that antibody remains immobilized in, uh, in the uh, agar uh, or during the electrophoresis. Now, for one dimension rocket immuno electrophoresis antigen samples are loaded in the well uh, punched in antibody containing gels before starting the electrophoresis and what you will get is you will get rocket shaped precipitin peaks where antigen and antibody meet at equivalence. Now, the concentration of a specific antigen can be determined by comparing rocket height of test, test samples with those uh, formed by known standards. Now, in two dimensional rocket uh, immuno electrophoresis what is done is first, first step is to perform regular agarose gel electrophoresis to separate the antigen in the sample and in the next step the lane containing the separated antigens will be cut like we have discussed in two dimensional gel electrophoresis and it will be fused to an agarose gel containing embedded antibodies. Uh, second electrophoresis will be run at 90 degrees to the first one and then again you will get the same patterns as the antigen migrates that is rocket shaped pattern. So, the precipitin arcs are formed along the uh, equivalence regions of antibody and antigen and number or multiplicity of the precipitin arcs uh, formed will depend on the complexity of the antigen sample and the anti serum in the second gel. Uh, let me show you this on your screen. So, two ways this could be done is one is you have agar containing gel uh, uh, antibody containing agar or antibody in agar and this is antibodies are all over uh, they are uh, when you are casting the gel you put the antibody. Now, what you do is you punch holes in here or slots for loading your sample and unknown and as you run the electrophoresis in one dimension then you will what you will get is say we have loaded the unknown in a particular concentration say 5, 10, 15, 20 or so. So, what you will get accordingly the antigen concentrations will get rocket shaped uh, pattern and the uh, like in uh, chromatography this particular uh, heights of the peak will give you the concentration idea. And so, unknown could be found out if unknown is this height then you can through calibration curve you can know the unknown. So, this is called rocket electrophoresis because of this pattern. Now, in two dimensional rocket electrophoresis what is done is that first it has been done in this direction electrophoresis that is you have uh, separated these components here uh, rather than punching hole and this whole thing has been fused into this next gel and which contains the antibody. 
Now, as they run in this direction now, direction of run will be this one that is at 90 degrees and you will get the patterns which will be like I said it could be different patterns because of the there will be lot of uh, mixture as complex is the mixture uh, the pattern will be that complex. So, uh, two dimensional uh, rocket electro uh, immunoelectrophoresis could be for performed or it could be uh, one dimensional immunoelectrophoresis uh, both ways it could be performed. All right, so, uh, once precipitin lines are formed in immunoelectrophoresis, they could be visualized. They should be uh, like I said, uh, this should be precipitin lines should be developed in humid chamber uh, and they could be directly seen by naked eyes uh, and if not, you can eliminate it from the site and on a dark background, they could be seen clearly. Uh, many times staining might be required, they could be stained with regular uh, protein stains and then uh, they could be like excess thing could be washed off and they could be seen. Uh, they could also be uh, permanent records can, can be made by photography and other means. So, this is uh, all about immunoelectrophoresis. Uh, Let us move on to the next technique that is capillary electrophoresis. If you could recall, we have talked about a phenomenon called uh, electroendosmosis or uh, this particular uh, in electro uh, isoelectric uh, flow actually, uh, in electroendosmosis uh, there is a net cathodic migration. So, capillary electrophoresis works on or takes advantage of that particular phenomenon. So, capillary electrophoresis could also be like it is also known as capillary zone electrophoresis and there are other names. Uh, it separates the ionic species by their charge. Uh, and then other factors could be frictional force and hydrodynamic radius, but mostly on charge. Uh, capillary electrophoresis involves electrophoresis of samples in a very nor narrow uh, bore tubes uh, fused silica or other and these are like say uh, internal diameter could be 50 micrometer and external diameter could be 300 micrometer. So, the, these are very narrow bore uh, fused silica tubes. Now, one advantage of using this capillaries is that uh, uh, they reduce the problems resulting from heating effects. So, uh, because uh, this particular surface to volume ratio uh, is there is a large surface to volume ratio and heat could be dissipated easily. Now, but uh, uh, it does not mean you can keep any length to do that there is certain balance between uh, the length and the voltage. Uh, and these are run at high voltage. So, uh, high voltage will general, uh, generally uh, cause lot of heating effect, but uh, since they are long and thin bore uh, or narrow bore uh, capillaries, uh, therefore, the heat dissipation can take place. Uh, but I said like increasing the capillary length will not improve as such the, uh, the, purif uh, the separation here. Now, types of molecules that can be separated, uh, there can be different kinds of molecules can be separated by capillary electrophoresis. They can range from say protein, peptides, amino acid, nucleic acid, inorganic or organic uh, molecules, uh, organic acids and lot of other different kinds of molecules could be separated uh, on capillary electrophoresis. Uh, as we have talked about uh, this particular phenomenon of electroendosmosis, the inside wall of the capillary is covered by, uh, if you could remember, it's, uh, we have discussed about this that is silanol groups which are charged above pH 3 or uh, starts uh, charging after pH 2 and this uh, negatively charged groups attracts cations to the inside wall of the capillary. Now, what will happen? the distribution of charge at the surface is uh, uh, like there is a stern double layer which is like kind of fixed and there is a diffused layer and this results in zeta potential. Now, zeta potential is the potential at any given point in double layer and decreases with increasing distance from the capillary wall. So, it will be more at closer to, to the wall and the stern model is also referred to as electric double layer model. So, what is happening here is you can see here there is a fused silica capillary tube it carries negative charge and negative charge will increase as the pH increases. Now, what you have seen here there is a fixed or you can say 
uh, in this figure rigid layer and there is a diffuse layer, stern layer actually. Uh, so, rigid layer is very close to this and diffuse layer has some leeway to move around. Uh, so, the electro osmosis or electro endo osmosis flow uh, is utilized in capillary electrophoresis and uh, the separations occur due to this phenomena. Uh, so, what happens is uh, that in electro endo osmosis, uh, the charges or the positive charges uh, which is in diffuse layer moves towards the cathode and uh, carries the whole uh, solution with it. So, there is a net flow towards cathode. So, net flow occurs as solvated cations drag along the solutions. Uh, now, in this figure as the pH increases, the mobility also increases here and uh, that is that's because the charges increases in here. So, uh, net flow is towards the cathode and it carries everything towards cathodes, cathode that is even uh, negative charges uh, entities towards cathode. Now, if you consider like say there is a 50 millimolar pH 8 buffer uh, that will flow to, uh, through a 50 centimeter capillary at say 5 centimeter per minute uh, uh, speed with 25 kilo volt applied potential. So, that is how it will flow and key factors that affect electroosmotic mobility will be dielectric constant and viscosity of the buffer. Uh, now, th this is like, so uh, if you see here, uh, since they are all moving towards one side, uh, many times it is hard to uh, really separate uh, neutral or uh, negatively charged species as you want to. Many times uh, uh, electro osmotic flow could be quenched by uh, say protection of silanols or uh, uh, or low pH. Uh, you can coat the uh, inner wall of the uh, fused silica and so uh, to quench or to suppress the negative charge, but then problem will be that only one kind of ions will move towards the cathode because net flow or your detector is towards the cathode. These equations here give you an idea about the electro osmotic mobility and uh, which are dependent on uh, like uh, dielectric constant of the uh, uh, buffer, zeta potential, viscosity, electric field all these factors affect the mobility. Now, a typical capillary electrophoresis a very simple schematic is shown in here in this figure. If you see here there are two reservoirs and this is anode, this is cathode, this is anodic reservoir, this is cathodic reservoir here. Uh, the capillary tube is dipped in here anodic and cathodic and this uh, uh, it could be 100 uh, 10 to 100 uh, micrometer inner diameter plus 20 to 100 centimeter length could be taken. There is a high voltage supply uh, which could go up to uh, say 50 kilo volt, but around 25 kilo volt is utilized. There is a detector at cathode side um, which, uh, which can detect or which will be uh, monitoring the whole run and uh, in a recorder, data recorder these things should be uh, recorded and analyzed. So, this is a typical capillary electrophoresis uh, setup uh, and uh, uh, the sample is loaded towards the anodic side, we will see how. Uh, so, what has happened is uh, systems like as we have seen main components are uh, sample wire, source and destination wires capillary electrodes, a high voltage power supply, a detector and data output and handling devices. The source while and destination while uh, which I have shown you, these are the source while anodic one and the destination while, they will uh, uh, like here these are filled and capillary also is filled with an electrolyte uh, which is aqueous buffer solution. Now, to introduce the sample here the capillary inlet. So, what will be done is that anodic buffer chamber could be removed and the sample chamber or sample containing device uh, the say it could be a simple syringe type or a beaker could be put in here and sample could be uh, loaded uh, or introduced into the capillary by different ways like capillary action. It could be a pressure injection where you can 
uh, through a syringe, uh, it could be uh, by pressure you can put in sample, a small amount of sample or it could be high voltage injection, where uh, you replace the anodic chamber by sample and uh, very instantly for a very small time high voltage is applied, uh, which leads to the introduction of sample into the uh, anodic side of the capillary and then again the capillary could be returned to the anodic chamber. Then the migration of the anal analytes uh, is then initiated by an electric field that is applied between the source and the destination while that is anodic and cathodic chambers. And is sub, uh, sub, uh, this is like supplied to the electrodes by a very high voltage power supply as I have shown you uh, in this case. All right. So, it is important to note that all ions that is positive as we have discussed earlier negative. So, positive, negative or neutral ions will be pulled through the capillary in the same direction by electro osmotic flow. Now, the analytes uh, separate as they migrate due to their electrophoretic mobility and are detected near the output end of the capillary that is cathodic side. So, uh, output of the detector is sent to a data output and handling device uh, such as an integrator or a computer where it will be analyzed. Data is displayed as an electro photogram uh, which, repo uh, which reports detector response as a function of time. Now, separated chemical compounds appear as peaks with different migration times uh, in an electrophoretogram. Uh, so, in electrophoretograms if you see like we said detectors are placed at the cathode side uh, uh, under common conditions and these detectors uh, should have high sensitivity. Uh, because uh, uh, like uh, uh, the speed at which these are gone is very fast. Uh, now, if you see the electrophoretograms, what you will see is the cations will come first, because they are obviously moving towards cathode and they will move faster and depending on how much charge is present, like say if some an, uh, analyte contains more positive charge, it will move faster, then neutral will go, uh, will be pushed in and then anionic because anion will also have electrophoretic mobility that will push them or move them towards the anode. But since net flow is towards cathode, they will be the last to appear there. So, that is how the uh, different analytes will be separated. There are a lot of advantages of capillary electrophoresis. In advantages, uh, it offers a new selectivity and an alternative to uh, HPLC, uh, though HPLC is more widely used. Uh, it is a very easy and predictable uh, kind of selectivity it has, uh, high separation efficiency that is you have high theoretical plate number. Uh, there is a very small sample size is put in, uh, separations are very fast like uh, say 30 to 40 minutes uh, or maybe less. It is automated, uh, it could be quantitative also, uh, it could be easily coupled to say mass spectrometry or others and lot of different kinds of modes are available like uh, as we will see. Uh, there are a lot of disadvantages also, uh, it could not be, it cannot be preparative uh, like you cannot do very large scale preparations or separations. Uh, low concentration and large volumes are very difficult to uh, do, then there, then there are problems of sticky compounds like for example, uh, certain proteins might stick to the uh, negative charges positively charged and there could be uh, streaking of the protein and you will not get a sharp peak. Uh, there might be certain species which are hard to dissolve. Uh, reproducibility is another problem, it is very hard to get many times uh, reproducible results. So, these are certain disadvantages, but there are many advantages to use capillary electrophoresis. Uh, there could be many modes of capillary electrophoresis, uh, uh, like say there could be capillary zone electrophoresis, where in free solutions you are doing or free buffer you are uh, uh, the experiment is being done. There could be capillary gel electrophoresis, where a particular matrix material is loaded or, uh, or matrix material is packed in these columns. Again, it is very hard to do uh, it by oneself, it is like commercially available columns are available. Uh, these are commercially available columns. Uh, and uh, they can, uh, it is uh, like by different strategy the gel is put in there. Uh, 
isoelectric focusing uh, mode could be available and for neutral molecules there is a micellar electrokinetic capillary uh, electrophoresis or chromatography we call it, um, where a detergent could be used and uh, a neutral molecule could partition when these micelle formation of detergent at certain concentration takes place. So, these are different modes uh, where uh, could be utilized in capillary electrophoresis for different applications. Uh, there could be many, many applications of capillary electrophoresis. It is a very uh, versatile technique for a uh, lot of different kinds of compounds to be separated and analyzed, uh, though uh, certainly instrumentation and uh, it is an expensive uh, uh, instrument, but it is a very, very handy. A lot of different kinds of like pharmaceuticals, uh, in pharmaceutical industry it is utilized uh, for say reaction intermediates purity va validation, stability, uh, final product testing, uh, ion analysis and lot of other different uh, applications. In biosciences, peptides, proteins, DNA carbohydrates can be analyzed. In food industry, inorganic cations, anions or organic acids, amino acids etcetera could be analyzed. In environmental science, uh, lot of pollution studies or pesticides. Uh, or lot of other uh, different kinds of metals, surfactants, dyes, uh, environmental pollutants could be analyzed on capillary electrophoresis. Uh, then forensic science uh, like say drugs of abuse, uh, explosives, uh, gun powders and other things could be utilized in, uh, could be analyzed in uh, capillary electrophoresis. So, lot of different areas utilize capillary electrophoresis for different applications. So, uh, this was about capillary electrophoresis, another very important technique uh, which could be utilized for uh, a particular application by various kinds of uh, in various kinds of fields actually various fields of biotechnology. So, this completes our section on electrophoresis. In this lecture, we have discussed about immunoelectrophoresis and the capillary electrophoresis, both are very important techniques. Immunoelectrophoresis has been uh, nowadays replaced by immunoblotting techniques, where like in western blotting or others, uh, uh, the particular uh, molecule say protein molecule can be transferred on nitrocellulose membranes and can then be probed by antibody linked to an enzyme and then it could be uh, the bands could be or the patterns could be seen. Uh, with enzyme reactions. So, these, this has, uh, but still immunoelectrophoresis is utilized for various applications. Likewise, capillary electrophoresis is uh, very good, very simple to use automated technique for various applications. In the next lecture, we will start a new topic, uh, which is also very important that is centrifugation techniques. Thank you.